This prayer is the climax of the of Jesus' discourse of his talk with his disciples, which began in chapter 13 in the Gospel of John. Uh, it is the Gethsemane of John, uh, and it is then Jesus' prayer, uh, but it, this one is not in the garden. It is not a prayer of agony. Uh, it is a prayer of intimacy and of the expression of the relationship between Jesus and the Father, between those who are present at this prayer for whom he is praying and Jesus. Uh, so it is this intimate conversation uh, with God. It is wholly distinctive. Uh, in the gospel tradition. Uh, and for that matter, there really isn't anything like it in the whole of the biblical tradition. It's a, a, an utterly distinctive prayer. In the context of the history of the tradition of Israel, uh, it is traditionally known as the high priestly prayer. Uh, and in that way, it is related to the prayer of the high priest on the Day of Atonement when the high priest went into the temple and prayed uh, for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. Uh, so it has some of that atmosphere. Uh, in fact, that is in the background of this, uh, of this prayer. Uh, and so it's dynamics. What this prayer does is an expression of that uh, intimacy uh, between Jesus and Father, uh, between those whom the Father has given Jesus and, uh, and Jesus himself. The themes of the prayer uh, are uh, you know, glorifying. You know, glorify me uh, as I have glorified you. Uh, one of the ways of understanding this is that it is in contrast to the shame that is associated with Jesus' death. So that throughout the Gospel of John, Jesus being glorified is that he is glorified uh, on the cross. He is glorified in his death, uh, which was, in terms of its actual character, uh, a supremely shameful death, uh, humiliating uh, in its character. Uh, that is also in the background of uh, Jesus' prayer for those uh, who were, have been given to him by God. Uh, his prayer is both for protection of them, protection from the evil one. Uh, it is a prayer that they may be one. It is a prayer that they may know uh, who Jesus is, uh, and that they may know that everything you have given me is from you. Um, but there's a sense in which uh, the content of the prayer is less important than its dynamics, uh, than the love, the honor, the glory that Jesus expresses to God, uh, and what you learn about uh, Jesus in the context of this prayer. Another dimension of it is that it is a somewhat extraordinary experience uh, to have you know, Jesus praying for you. Uh, and so whenever there is an experience of 
alienation or separation or of not knowing who God is or whatever. This is a prayer to return to and, and to enter into that place of allowing Jesus to pray for you. Um, now, in terms of learning this prayer, uh, it too is a, um, a challenge, let's say. Uh, the verbal threads weave this prayer together, uh, glorify, glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, uh, eternal life, uh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. Uh, those you gave me, uh, those whom you gave me from the world, and you gave them to me, and you have uh, everything that you have given me is from you. Uh, these uh, phrases link things together in the various episodes. And one of the things that I would suggest is that you underline those and listen for them because they are the hooks on which uh, the memory of this prayer is even possible. Uh, but I would highly recommend uh, that you learn this prayer by heart because there is a way in which getting Jesus' words into your heart uh, and into your mind is also a way of learning one dimension of and a central dimension of who Jesus is, of how he thinks, of how his mind works. Uh, now, it is clearly... Uh, a very distinctive uh, experience of Jesus' mind that is present in the Gospel of John in contrast to uh, the synoptics. Uh, but there are, uh, in fact, many lines of continuity between uh, the character of Jesus in John and his character in the other Gospels. Uh, but there are also significant differences. And... Uh, and this is one of those major differences, uh, that his prayer is not in any sense a prayer of agony or of uh, desire that he not have to die. It is rather a prayer fully accepting that reality and praying then that it may be for the glory of God and that it may then glorify him as well as glorify the Father. Another uh, dimension of this that I would call attention to is to hear this prayer in the context of uh, the stories of the ancient Near East and specifically uh, the story of Homer. Uh, in Homer, in the Iliad, there is constant conversation about the glory that will come uh, to the great warriors of Greece. So Achilles' glory that he gains by defeating Hector and by his uh, power in battle. Um, so the heroic tradition in uh, the Greco-Roman world was related to glory that one achieves in battle. Here, glory is gained by a kind of conflict, a kind of battle. But it is a battle with the powers of this age. Uh, but the glory that comes to Jesus is also glory that comes in his death but it is of a very different character than what happens in the Iliad. He doesn't kill anybody. He receives glory by giving his life for the sake of others. 